Next day, they drove downtown to buy things needed for the camp. Any wearable purchase worked wonders with Lo. She seemed her usual sarcastic self at dinner. Immediately afterwards, she went up to her room to plunge into the comic books acquired for rainy days at Camp Q. They were so thoroughly sampled by Thursday that she left them behind. I too retired to my, to my lair and wrote letters. My plan now was to leave for the seaside and then, when school began, resume my existence in the Hayes household, for I knew already that I could not live without the child. On Tuesday, they went shopping again, and I was asked to answer the, the phone if the camp mistress rang up during their absence. She did, and a month or so later, we had occasion to recall our pleasant chat. That Tuesday, Lo had her dinner in her room. She had been crying after a routine row with her mother, and as, I ha as had happened from former occasions, had not wished uh, me to see the, her swollen eyes. She had one of those tender complexions that, after a good cry, get all blurred and inflamed and morbidly alluring. I regretted keenly her mistake about my private aesthetics, for I simply loved that tinge of body Chilean pink that row rose about the lips, those wet matted eyelashes, and naturally her bashful her bashful whim deprived me of many opportunities of spacious consolation. There was, however, more to it than I thought. As we sat in the darkness of the veranda, a rude wind uh, had put out her red candles, Hayes, with a dreary love, laugh, said she had told Lowe that her beloved Humbert thoroughly approved of the whole camp idea. And now, added Hayes, the child throws a fit. Pretext. You and I want to get rid of her. Actual reason, I told her we would exchange tomorrow for plainer stuff so much to cute night things that she bullied me into buying for her. You see, she sees herself as a starlet. I, I see her as a sturdy, healthy, but decidedly homely Kate. This, I guess, is at the root of her troubles. On Wednesday, I managed to waylay low for a few seconds. She was on the landing in sweatshirt and green-stained white shorts, rummaging in a trunk. I said something meant to be friendly and funny, but she only emitted a snort without looking at me. Desperate, dying Humbert, patted her clumsily on her co coccyx, and she struck him quite painfully with one of the late Mrs. Mr. Hayes's shoe trees. Double crosser, she said, as I crawled downstairs rubbing my arm with a great show of rue. She did not condescend to have dinner with Hump and Mum, washed her hair and went to bed with her ridiculous books, and on Thursday quiet Mrs. Hayes drove her to Camp Q. As greater authors than I have put it, as greater authors than I have put it, let readers imagine etc. On second thought, I, must, I may as well give uh, uh, those imaginations a, quick in, a kick in the pants. I knew I had fallen in love with Lolita forever, but I also knew she would not be forever Lolita. She would be 13 on January 1st. In two years or so she would cease being an infant and would run into a young girl and then into a college girl, that horror of horrors. The word forever referred only to my own passion, to the eternal Lolita as reflected in my blood the Lolita whose iliac crests had not yet flared, flared, the Lolita that today I could touch and smell and hear and see, the Lolita of the strident voice and the rich brown hair, of the bangs and the swirls at the sides and the curls at the back and the sticky hot neck and the vulgar vocabulary, revolting, super, luscious, goon, drip, that Lolita, my Lolita, poor Catullus, would lose forever. So how could I afford not to see her for two months of summer insomnias, two whole months out of the two years of her remaining nymphage? Should I disguise myself as a somber old-fashioned girl, gawky, 
Mademoiselle Humbert and put up my tent of, on the outskirts of Camp Q, in the hope that its russet nymphs would clamor, let us adopt the deep voices, DP, and drag the sad, shyly smiling bird au grand pied to the rustic hearth, birth will sleep with Dolores haste. Idle dry dreams, two months of beauty, two months of tenderness would be squandered forever, and I could do nothing about it, but nothing, Marianne. One drop of rare honey, however, that Thursday did hold in its acorn cup. Haze was to drive her to the camp in the early, mor in the early morning. Upon sundry sounds of departure reaching me, I rolled out of bed and leaned out on the window. Under the poplars, the car was already a drop. On the sidewalk, Louise stood shading her eyes with her hand, as if the little traveler were already riding into the low morning sun. The gesture proved to be premature. Hurry up, shouted Hayes. My Lolita, who has half, who was half in and about to slam the car door, wind down the glasses, waved to Louise, and the poplars, whom and which she was never to see again, interrupted the motion of fate. She looked up and dash, dashed back into the house, Hayes furiously calling after her. A moment later, I heard my sweetheart running up the stairs. My heart expanded with such force that it almost blotted me out. I hitched up on the pants of my pajamas, flung the door open, and simultaneously Lolita arrived in her Sunday frock, stamping, panting, and then she was in my arms, her innocent mouth melting under the ferocious pressure of dark male jaws, my palpitating darling. The motion of fate was resumed. The blonde leg was pull, pulled in. The car door was slammed, was re-slammed, and driver haze at the violent wheel Robert Red Lips, reading in angry, inaudible speech, swung my darling away, while unnoticed by them or Ruiz, old Miss Opposite, an invalid feebly but rhythmically, waved from her fine veranda. <laughs>